What's up, investors? Chase here from the Note MBA podcast. On this week's episode, we talk a little bit about my marketing event this past weekend. It was a massive success, and it gave me a newfound respect for the likes of Tony Robbins and just your everyday average teacher. I have no idea how you guys do it all the time. We also talk about Robbie winning some tax reprieve, winning a tax situation up in Cook County, which is damn near impossible to do all of the time. So we're very excited about that and potentially bringing a new vendor to you guys. And lastly, we talk a little bit about Robbie doing some manual labor. Anyway, be sure to check out this week's show right now. Yeah, you know, it's always good if you bring your own work gloves, you know, You'll, you feel a little better when it's your sweaty hands that have been inside of those things. Um, I think connect, it's, I think it's with awesome. all the other manual labor that, that those gloves have been through with you. <laughs> Look, man, these first seconds performing, non-performing. What the f***? Note buyers, when it seems like you're in this business alone, no Chase, Robert and the rest of their tribe are at it every week. They're bringing updates from their own note businesses as they work to find, fund, and finish deals. Follow along as they share their grassroots education with you, tuition-free. If you'd like to know more about what they do and to download the entire back catalog, check out NoteMBA.com. Now, here are your hosts, Chase Thompson and Robert Woods. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Note NBA podcast, your home for note investing on iTunes. I am Chase Thompson, joined as always by Robert Woods, Mr. Woods. What's up in gloomy Florida, Orlando, Florida? It's well, still- it was when we started recording. I guess the sun just started <laughs> cracking through the uh, peeking through, saying hello. Very uh, things nice. are good in Florida, man. How are you doing? Uh, you get uh, rested up after your long marketing weekend. I did sort of get rested up. I took a day off yesterday, kind of be with the family after three long days. I mentioned it in our Monday email, but I have a profound new respect for people. Uh, that both do this at a high level uh, business wise, you know, not I'm not putting myself on the plane of but I mentioned it in the in the email, someone like a Tony Robbins, who does these continually like throughout the year, these intense kind of on stage for many, many hours at a time. It's a it's a it's a uniquely difficult thing that I, I had planned for all of the training. But I, I don't know what planning or effort you can put into the actual uh, the work on that side it was a little it was different. Disseminating. Yeah. The Post dissemination planet. was a lot more taxing than I had anticipated. So all the way from those types of people to even, again, like I talked about during the class, but even teachers. I mean, you know, you're you're a, a, a second, third grade teacher. You're up in front of the room six hours a day. You're teaching whatever you're teaching. And, you know, those little kids don't give a crap or, you know, high schoolers sometimes can be total jerks. Like I just a newfound respect for those that. Uh, do this day in, day out, or at the very least, more often than I do. It was well, good. tremendous, glad but to, glad man. to hear it went well. Glad yes. to hear it went. Well. Yes, it was. Uh, it was well worth, well worth the time and effort. I, uh, I, I've been, I've been told through numerous testimonials. So it was a lot of fun. It was a good time. Uh, what about you, good sir? Did you have a good weekend? I did have a good weekend. I've been working all weekend. The uh, 2017 theme in full effect of organization is still going strong, which means I still have organizing to do, which is a good thing. Keeps me active. Uh, But yeah, Florida was nice and enjoyable this weekend. And uh, I actually started doing some more research, probably on a topic you talked about over your little, your weekend as well, on uh, Facebook advertising for a property going to foreclosure that we want to sell third party. And we're going to try this again, similar to the one that we already did up in Columbus. We're going to do another one in Ohio Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. give it a test and and see if we can get this thing sold to somebody else so we can get our money back. So this one is to similar effect. We're we're kind of tackling it the same way. And for this particular one, obviously looking to get it off, get it off our hands or what have you. Um, Is there anything different? I mean, I know with the last one, we were looking to sell it for X and ended up going for X plus some, which I think, you know, we couldn't necessarily 100 percent attribute to to the advertisement effort. But uh, is this a similar scenario? Is this kind of a a, a, basically an exact scenario? We've got we set our max bid. Actually, our max bid we set right at uh, the 67 percent, like that two thirds Mm -hmm. number that you need in Ohio. And hopefully it just goes right there. It's a nice property. It uh, just needs a little more work. And to be honest, I, I don't want to do a renovation where that property's at. And the property itself, when I got in it, just had a, a little bit of a wonky layout 
in in uh, I just didn't have a good vibe with the property. It wasn't one I wanted to stay into, and I'd rather just get the money back and turn it. So that's that's other. This is more of a in a unique way. It's a financial decision. Also, we're going to make money if it sells at two thirds, obviously. But we just want out of that deal. I just didn't really feel connected with the property. And what about the? I mean, obviously, it, it seemed to have worked, right? But what about that first process of doing it uh, up in up in Ohio? You're like, wow, is this the way to go now? Or is this kind of the way that we move them from here on out? I mean, was it was it that effective, you feel? Is this kind of that second running? I think it was, it's too soon to tell. And, uh, <laughs> you know, for, this, for the small amount that it costs, you know, we're going to spend about $200 between advertising and labor to put this thing t- together. Yeah. I think that's a good investment to get some extra marketing out there on it. And we don't have, we haven't done it enough, but I think what we saw from the results end of it justified at least giving it another try and seeing if we have the same type of data collection on this next one that we did on the last one. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Very cool. Um, well, you know me, I'm always down for the uh, running of Facebook ads and, and trackings and whatnot. I'm okay with all of that business. Um, so, Really quick, since we're obviously, I don't want to get too meta, we're recording a podcast, talk about another podcast, but I did recently tell you to listen, and I'm not sure if you had an opportunity yet, to one of the most recent uh, Tim Ferriss podcasts with Mr. a guy, Money Mustache. Mr. Money Mustache, talking about his, uh, it's, it's a, first of all, if you don't listen he's to Tim Ferriss podcast, cat. it's great, it's an inter- he's an interesting dude, he talks a lot about getting out there, getting into, getting dirty, right, getting messy, doing some manual labor and how that brings him happiness and joy in his life. What, uh, what say you about that today? I know you've got a, uh, a fit of, of manual labor ahead of you today. Yeah. David Galinsky's doing, he's remodeled. He's doing house hacking. Yes. And, uh, this guy's he's 21. He's such a smart kid. I hate to call him a kid. I don't mean to be condescending. I'm young, but he's just so smart, man. He's hardworking. I, we were hanging out a couple weeks ago and he was going over some stuff. And then I'd mentioned, I was like, you're, he's doing house hacking. So he's renovating the property while he's living in it. And I think he's been in the deal about a year. And I remember when I first moved back to Florida and even actually when I lived in California and I was remodeling a condo, my brother came out and he would help me. And just having him there for a couple hours was just, you know, especially when you were trying to do it yourself and like, you're kind of, you know what you're doing, but you're still beating your head against the wall some of the times trying to do stuff with just two hands when you really just need somebody to help hold. Yeah. So yeah. I was like, I'll go spend the day with you hanging out. I haven't done it for probably, I haven't done that kind of like work in a property for like three years. So, you know, go hang out for a day and it hopefully will be a nice day that I can get out of the house too. You know, I've been in the <laughs> office doing this organization thing for a little bit. So I need a little <laughs> change of scenery. He'll have a, a master craftsman sitting there, someone who cares about the work and uh, swinging hammers, doing having a good time. I like their I like um, right before we hit record, we we're talking about it. And I love that one of your your only question to him was essentially, you know, I don't know what y'all are doing, but like, do I need gloves? I love you're just like, do I need gloves? Is that nope, we're good. All right, we're ready to rock and roll. I love that. Yeah, you know, it's always good if you bring your own work gloves, you know, <laughs> You'll, you feel a little better when it's your sweaty hands that have been inside of those things. Um, really I think connect. it's. I Connect with awesome. all the other manual labor that, that those gloves have been through with you. <laughs> Look, man, these 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 gloves have seen things, brother. I, we've, we've built things. This is awesome. Oh, uh, dude, no kidding. Speaking of like gloves and rebuilt things, we finally got that property in Atlanta sold. That we just had a lot of extra delays that shouldn't have happened. We had a bankruptcy get filed that didn't need to get filed, and we couldn't get away around it, even though the property was vacant. We had a hot water heater rust out and cause some moisture damage that had to be taken care of. We had a contractor not finish work and then he got paid, which was a huge, huge oversight. And that has been, uh, we'll definitely say been more than corrected inside of the system to make sure contractors are not accidentally getting checks handed to them when they should not be. Uh, but we finally got it sold. Um, Definitely time ate up a lot on this deal of what the return really should have been. And there was one of the other unique things. I don't remember had we talked about it a couple of weeks ago, but the, the double contingency inside of the contract that we, we didn't really know about regarding the selling of the seller's home. We, we, we got into that a little bit, didn't we? The, we? Oh, yeah. I think I had mentioned that it was a septic tank, right? Yeah, but you didn't uh-huh. fully you know, divulge. So that was kind of why it was on the list today. So, so what's going on with that one? 
Well, so part of the other reason why it took so long to get this property closed is, you know, the seller or the buyer, excuse us, our buyer had a contingency on selling their home. And I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a normal contingency. It's not crazy. I mean, you would like to avoid that if you could. What we didn't know, we didn't ask and weren't told <laughs> was that the buyer of our buyer's home had a contingency in their contract regarding a third property now that's in Boston uh, and it being contingent on that property getting sold. So basically oh. we're two house, two closings removed. I didn't even think to ask. And it's just one of those things to just add in the back of your mind when you see that contingency in a contract to just go, okay, let me put, make a little mark put a little flag next to it or however you, you document those things and say, I need to make sure we reach out and get a copy of their contract, their purchase agreement and find out what kind of clauses did they sign? Did they get themselves into a good contract or are they in something that looks a little flaky, like it might fall apart, financing's not lined up or some of it, something's just not jiving with it. And that cost us uh, almost two and a half months worth of the closing from the property getting pushed back due to delays in the closing of these other properties. Wow. And so first of all, I want to add this one down for the, the woods isms that I have, you know, like the, you don't know what you don't know. And uh, there's a couple of them that I love that you say the, we didn't know, didn't ask and weren't told. That's pretty, Mm -hmm. that's pretty great. I love that. So the only way to really avoid this in the future, read the contract more clearly, throw up a fly. I mean, Ask, are there any contingencies upon this deal? I mean, is that is that really the uh, the extent of yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, you, next time, you know, I see a contingency in the contract, you just say, hey, let me get a copy of their purchase contract and just take a look at theirs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And that's, I mean, that's, it's. I think it's a pretty standard thing, but it's it's one of those little items that I think I'd never heard of it from anybody. I, I didn't think to ask it. Yeah. Like, yeah. no. And you would you would like to hope that somebody would tell you that. But at the end of the day, I guess it's not their responsibility to disclose extra information while they're trying to do a transaction. You know, Mm -hmm. I don't it's not the most transparent, but uh, you also can't say that they were like withholding information because we never asked for it. (laughs) Interesting. Yeah, we saw the contingency kind of upon sale and all that stuff a, a ton in the mortgage industry. I just have never really seen it to that level. And then, of course, cross state, you know, cross, you know, uh, up the Eastern seaboard. I need this. I need this house to also move. And so like, that's uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. That's bonkers. Uh, we've also been doing a ton of deal talk regarding the wonderful, beautiful, sometimes pain in the ass city that is Chicago and Cook County. But you just had a, a, a bit of a triumph there. I, I, I hope I'm not overstating, but no, I think it's a, this huge is a win. This is a win, right? It's I mean, a win. We, we challenged the tax value on one of my properties in Chicago and got a six, actually it's over $6,000 reduction in the annual taxes due on the property. And uh, we pay 35% of that to the company that uh, did the challenge for us. Wait, is it maybe it's 50 percent this year and 35 percent anything in the future? I got to double check. But whatever it is, it was definitely a steal. It took me about three minutes worth of work to actually get all the documents I needed. And then I've got to send one follow up thing when we get the taxes all lined up for the actual the building itself. And, you know, it even if it's 50 percent, I've got to double check now. It makes me concerned. I can't remember that from memory. <laughs> um, it's a contract contingency. dollars savings on it. That's awesome. And it was, I mean, it was just such an easy thing. And I've, I've got to do a little more research into it. So what it has me thinking now is, should I be challenging the value on all of my properties? Or how do you look at that? Like, I just knew for this property, it was extremely high. So I asked and they said, it's a good fit. But I never got criteria from him. So I think that might be a, a good follow up show of like what what makes a good criteria? When is it worth your time to challenge the uh, tax basis on a property? Yeah. And is so a couple of things. Is it a lot like uh, some of those companies that that supposedly and I only say supposedly because. Uh, my dealings with them have not been great so far. Uh, but some of those companies that supposedly say flag a good or not good uh, potential deal for like a hardest hit fund. Like they look at all the criteria that you might send them and say, yeah, these guys might be a good, you know, fit. Let's move forward. Is it that type of scenario where you go, here's my stuff. Here's my address. Here's this. And they give you kind of like a, 
yay nay, and then you move forward? Is that what's up with that? I think that's exactly how it works. And then you did all of just filling out the docs. I was going to ask what the process was like, but for you, it was just docs. I mean, there wasn't really much else to it. And some information. It was extremely, extremely easy. And um, interesting. So just filling out the docs, giving them, giving the information, moving forward. Yeah. I, I, if, if everything's on, I don't assume anything's not on the up and up, but what I mean to say is, is that if it worked, if it's an effective process, if it doesn't, you know, throw any red flags up for you later in some way, shape or form, like, oh, this is that guy that always, you know, uh, I think it's fantastic. Well, I guess, especially if it's done on your behalf. I mean, you know, they're not going to know you from Adam, right? So I'm down. I think it's great. Yeah. So it's uh, definitely. Oh, here we go. I've got, they've got, I've got all sorts of information here. Uh, contingencies. <laughs> More contingencies. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just looking at how you actually, uh, how you actually pay them. Yeah. 10% contingency of your first year's estimated tax savings. Savings may be for one, two or three years, depending on the tax years of the reassessment triennial for which the appeal appeal is filed. The amount of savings may vary from initial estimates due to changes in annual tax rates and other factors. 25% 25% contingency for county certificates of air. Okay. So I guess it's a lot less expensive than I thought it was going to be. That sounds much cheaper. Wow. Yeah. Actually, you, I haven't gotten the official finalization of it. So maybe yeah. once I get that, then we can revisit this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, listen, I, for as much investing as we and others do in this area, I'm absolutely positive that uh, any and all listeners that are that are interested in this are going to want to know. Uh, how the process went and any sort of recommendations thereof. If it's uh, if everything kind of works out and all of that. And for the, the yeah. fact that it's 10%, I mean, that's, that's, that's a totally different number. Uh, so very cool. I think it's a fantastic, I, you know, probably a vendor, right? Not obviously not a tool, a fantastic vendor. Uh, is this somebody that if things look great, you would be willing to share with the, uh, with the audience? Yeah. Oh, completely. Killer. Completely. Killer. You know, they love themselves some new vendors and resources. Uh, all righty. Well, it's going to technically be a shorter show than usual because Mr. Woods has to get out there, throw on the gloves, swing some hammers. But is there anything you have left for the people, Mr. Woods? No, I think that's uh, the best of what we got today. It's been a <laughs> short week. I've been, we've got, we had a couple sales and closings at some other properties. So I've been just focused on getting those things all set up in the system. Yep. But other than that, no, it's been a good week. Hopefully everybody else has a good week. I'll steal Chase's thunder and tell you if you haven't told five people about the Note NBA podcast yet, why don't you go find another five if you already did also and just tell them about the podcast. Just five on five on five, baby. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening to the show this week. If you have not already, head over to iTunes, give us a rating, give us a review, and, of course, subscribe. We appreciate you being here. Everything we talked about this week and every week can be found in the show notes over at NoteNBA.com. We'll catch you guys next week. Take it easy, guys. Have a good one.